my mind about it. I know what I used to be, and I know where he brought me from. Amen. Turn Second Timothy with me tonight, please. Chapter number 3 and verse number 15. In one verse of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.15. And, and then from a child, the apostle is addressing now Timothy. And from a child, and that from a child thou hast known the holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. That's a big deal, don't you think? You have the Holy Bible and it can make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed. It doesn't mean the men are perfect, but the Word's perfect. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now that, of course, is the declaration of the Bible about itself. The Scripture is inspired of God. And it was a big deal for the Jews to raise their children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Uh, here's what Vladimir Lenin said. He said, give me four years to teach the children. Give me four years to teach the children. And the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. That's one of the fathers of communism. He's the one who implemented Karl Marx, uh, Das Kapital, was uh, Vladimir Lenin. And of course, communism is a failed thing. It was failed from the beginning. Uh, just like Mao Zedong failed in China. Communism fails wherever it goes. Why? Because people aren't the same. You can't put everybody, everybody's, one size doesn't fit all. And communism will never work. But see, the basis of communism is atheism. No God. Communism is dialectical materialism. That's what it's called. Materialism. It's all about here and the now, the physical. And so Lenin said, give, the, give, them, give them to me for the first uh, uh, four years. Well, they tell us, they, when I say they, I'm talking about these, the ones who, who are the, uh, many of them self-proclaimed uh, experts, that the first five years of a child's life are the most formative. And there's probably a great deal of truth in that. Uh, the first five years. What you do with a child, the first five years of its life, is going to determine a great deal with what happens the rest of its life. Even if that child gets saved and they're born again, the old man or that old nature has been conditioned, has been preconditioned by those first five years. So it will be a problem. They'll have to deal with it. This is why the Apostle Paul says, and such will have problems in the flesh, referring back to the many problems that we can have in the flesh. So the first five years are very informative. They're very important. When a child reaches five in this country, they send them to K-5. And then the six, six, years, six years of age, first grade. The uh, school system wants your children. They want your children as quick as they can get them. And uh, the sad thing is there was a time in this nation when the school system was, was, certainly wasn't anti-Christ. Uh, it might not have been evangelistic, but it wasn't anti-God. But uh, it has evolved to the point now where you better be mighty careful. You better be very careful at what they're teaching your children. They want your children. But in any event, early childhood is very important because the enemy can make a stronghold in that. He can make a stronghold. And a stronghold is very important to understand because a stronghold is a basis of operation for Satan. He operates from that stronghold. Whatever point he has in your life that is a stronghold, he will operate from it. He'll operate from it. Come back to it. Go out from it. Come back to it. This has been said, and I can't find who said it, but here's what they said. Give me a child the first six years of his life, and you can do what you will with him thereafter. That's, that's some certainty, isn't it? That they know what they're going to do with six years of its life. They will instill in that child certain characteristics that will stay with it the rest of its life. The Hebrew, when he raised his child, was so observant of the children growing up that he had 11 different words that referred to the stages of growth of that child. Bakar is a firstborn, Jeremiah 4, 31. A yanek is a suckling, Isaiah 11, 8. A gamul is a weaned child, Isaiah 28, 
calf is a child clinging to his mother, Esther 3.13. And Howlel is a child or a boy, Psalm 8.2. And Elim is a child becoming firm, Isaiah 7.14. And Naar is a youth, servant, 1 Samuel chapter number 16, verse 18. And then a Yeled is a son, a young man, Isaiah chapter number 9, verse 6. Then a Bakur is the ripened one, a young warrior, Isaiah 3, verse 19. They're so instructive with this that they even mention a fatherless child. There's a, a Yathon is a word for a fatherless child. And in Psalm 146 and verse number 9, here's what it says about that child. The Lord, Jehovah, preserveth the strangers. He relieveth, that means he supports the fatherless and widow. They touch his heart because he knows how much that child has been deprived because he doesn't have a father. But the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. You say, well, does he deal with everyone the same way? Oh, no, no, no. Everybody's not the same. Sin's the same. But oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Uh, when God Almighty deals with you, He deals with you on the basis of what you know, the circumstances surrounding your life, the light you have, the rebellion in your heart, and He deals with you justly. He's a good God, folks. Amen. Some of you were born into home, good mother, good father. God bless you. That's good. Rejoice and shout the rest of your life over that because that's a gift from God. Some of you don't even know who your mother was or your father was. Some of you didn't have a mother or a father. You were raised, some of you were raised in a home, raised in an institution. The circumstances are not the same. Everybody's not born with a silver spoon in their mouth. God knows that. And God, according to what it says right here in the book of Psalms, He makes a special provision for a fatherless child. In His heart, the fatherless and the widows, don't mess with them. <laughs> mess with them and God will mess with you. <laughs> Amen. So, this shows me that a Hebrew is concerned about the upbringing of their children. The Hebrew home was the center of education. The home. The home was. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he shall not depart from it. The word train in Hebrew, chanak, means to initiate, discipline, dedicate, train up. The Hebrew midwife had a practice of once the, once the baby was born to immediately open its mouth, reach in and clean out everything out of its mouth so that child could breathe. And uh, the uh, book of Proverbs talks about wisdom that's personified. The idea is that to the Hebrew, to a Jew, this knowledge, this wisdom, this learning, this understanding of God is from the very beginning, as far back as they can remember. This is why Paul said, from a child, Timothy, from a child, as far back as you can remember. In other words, Timothy, you can never remember a time, never can you remember a time when your mother Eunice or your grandmother Lois had not been teaching you and instructing you in the Lord. As far back as you can remember, you were taught about them. Now, the thing about Timothy, that's, 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 that's different. Timothy had a Jewish mother, but he had what kind of a father? He had a Greek father, exactly. So you can see that even though one parent, even though you have one parent that loves the Lord, you can get the job done. In Proverbs chapter number 8 and verse number 7, the Bible says, For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. The words that come forth from the mouth, the Hebrew took as an indication of what's going on in the heart. And what goes on in the heart is an indication of what the person is. For the Bible says, As a man thinketh in his heart, what? So is he. So the mouth, therefore, becomes a, uh, a telegram, if you please, or whatever you want to call it, of the heart. It shows the heart. <laughs> if you have a problem with blasphemy, folks, if you've got a problem with filthy talk, uh, it's not you need, you don't need to clean your life up. You don't need to straighten up and quit talking like that. You need to get right with God. You're not right. You're not right. And you're probably not saved. The worst preaching you'll ever hear, and this is horrible preaching, is when somebody preaches to you and tells you to do better, straighten up. This is not right. You need to quit doing this and quit. You don't need to quit anything. You need to be born again. The quitting is changing of the nature. 
Once the nature has changed, the rest of it will follow suit. You don't, you don't whitewash sepulchers. You don't put the cart before the horse. You've got to get the inside right, not the outside. And so the mouth, the mouth therefore becomes uh, an alarm to you. It's like the canary in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, cave, you know. It's, a, it's an alarm, alert. It's an alarm. It's saying there's a problem. If you've got a filthy mouth, you've got a filthy heart. So the Hebrew was very careful. They looked carefully into the mouth and what came forth from it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 11 and verse 18. Deuteronomy 11, 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these words in your heart, in your soul. Bind them for a sign upon your hand, that, you, that they may be as frontless between your eyes. And they wear a box right here on, in the front of their eyes. I forget exactly what that's called. It's phylactery. Phylactery. They wrap it around their arms. They have what's called a mezuzah, which is a scripture that is, that is planted on the doorpost on a Jewish home. When you go into their home, here is a mezuzah. This is holding the scripture. It's holding Deuteronomy for one, the Torah, the Bible. And that means that every time they go into that house and come out of that house, they're, com they're coming and going by virtue of the Word of God. It, make, it, makes as it allows them access to their home. In other words, every aspect of their life is connected with the Scripture. And that's the way it ought to be. I mean, what part of your life do you do that's not connected with the Scripture? Is there something that you're doing that you don't want the Bible to know about? The Word of God is quick. It's alive. It's watching you. It's listening to you. And it's reading your heart. <laughs> so that's spooky, preacher. <laughs> that's the Bible. That's the Bible. In verse number 19, ye shall teach them your children. Watch this. Ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates. That's the mezuzah that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children, the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. That's remarkable, don't you think? That's 3,400 years ago. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Have we improved upon that? No, 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 no. No way have we improved upon that. Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse number 20 uh, you notice that these Proverbs become prominent when it gets down to the Word of God and wisdom. And you cannot separate the two. You can't have wisdom without the Word of God. If you have the Word of God, you're going to have wisdom. Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse 20, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. See what a good mother and father is important? The commandment of your father. I never heard my father give me one commandment in my life. And God help you if you knew what my mother ever said to me and did before me you wouldn't want to know. You see what I mean? So what got me? Do you know what got me? He chooses who He chooses and spoke to me in utter darkness as an outcast without God, lost and on my way to hell, and the light of God's mercy and grace shone down upon my soul, or I wouldn't be here tonight. Bless His name. That just shows you that you can be an Orpah. You can come from an accursed uh, uh, land. You can come from there. And God's a gracious God. Aren't you glad for that? God's gracious. God's gracious. So what is the mother's role? You know, mothers and fathers in the Bible have a far more important role than biological part just simply bringing a child into the world. In some places, eight out of ten of the children are born out of wedlock. You think the nation can survive like that? Do you think you can have a civil society with that kind of birth rate? Folks, that's got to be stopped. Over half the marriage is ending in divorce. You can, make all, you can pass all the laws and do all the social reform you want to until you start changing the fundamental problems in this nation. And what's the fundamental problem, preacher? They need more education and money. No, that's not the problem. The problem is the human heart. That's the only thing that can change a man. They talk about drive-by shooting. We got drive-by fathers. <laughs> yeah, we do. Saw on, the, on Drudge today, one man just passed away, 87 years old. He had 57 children. 
not by one woman. Fifty-seven children. Now ask yourself this question, who raised those kids? Who, who fed them? Who clothed them? You see what I mean? That's a problem, big time. Fifty-seven children scattered all over the place. The first education was necessarily the mother's responsibility. Infancy in Israel was prolonged state of nurture. Babies nursed for three years. They taught the domestic rites, songs of the weekly festivals, feast, and the annual festival. Edersheim, Alfred Edersheim, or Edersheim, whose thick volume, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, Converted Jew, which is an outstanding work, along with the temple and its sacrifices and a lot of other books he wrote, states that children were given careful training of the memory before the age of three. By the time the child was three, formal homeschooling was begun in the form of memorizing scripture, benedictions, and wise sayings. Mnemonic rules were devised to help the child retain what he memorized. Each child had a guardian promise that he inserted in his daily prayers. The earliest hymns taught would be the Psalms for the days of the week or festive Psalms, such as Psalm 113 through 118. Can you improve upon that? Amen. Here's what Mr. C.F. Potter said, Humanism, a New Religion. Education is thus the most powerful ally of humanism. Every American public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday schools, meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children, do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? What can they do? The only thing that can be done is overruled by the grace of God. That's right. But that's the situation. What do you do now, though, when you can't even get them in Sunday school? Where are we going? Where's it headed? Where's the nation headed? You have those who have hand out and those who work. You can give a man a hand up, you can help him. If all you do is hand out to him, you're not helping him. You're hurting him. Your parents, did they teach you to work? That's the greatest thing they could teach you. They teach you responsibility, to be accountable for your debts, your bills, what you owe someone else. That's a wonderful thing if you were taught that. Did your parents teach you a skill? Or did they, if they couldn't teach it to you, at least wise, you know, uh, push you to do it? Encourage you to learn a skill or be educated? One of the two. Or you'll flip hamburgers the rest of your life. That's right. A young woman a few months back I heard say, I'm going to get pregnant and I'm going to have a bunch of kids and I'm going to get on WIC. WIC is the government program from Lyndon Baines Johnson War on Poverty that was about 40, 50 years ago. You could ask yourself the question right now. After this great society that Lyndon Johnson envisioned, 50, 60, whenever it was, his War on Poverty, Ask yourself the question now, is there more or less poverty in this country than there was back then? Do you want to you know how to do it? Go back to the home and go back to the villages and the families and go back to the, into the communities and start taking them out and teaching them how to work, what to do, give them a skill or an education, one or the other. And that has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It has to do with what you are. Red, yellow, black, and white. That's the issue. That's the problem. But it all boils down to the basic problem. That is that the nation itself has completely rejected what God said that we are. We are fallen creatures with the need of redemption. You can have all the high-sounding, smooth-talking politicians in the world. You can have all of the philosophical uh, essays written. You can have all of the new disorders created by the Psychiatric Association. You can pile the dope and you can pile the drugs on top of it, but you're not going to change the basic problem. The basic problem is men are fallen creatures and they need to be born again. Amen. That's the problem. That's the problem. So what do you do? The Youth Liberation Program list of wants. We want the power to determine our own destiny. We want the immediate end of adult chauvinism. We want full civil and human rights. Now, what are we talking about here? Children. 
These are the rights of children. We want the right to form our education according to our needs. We want the freedom to form into communal families, like Hillary's Village, for example, that raises a child. We want the end of male chauvinism and sexism. We want the opportunity to create an authentic culture with institutions of our own making. We want sexual self-determination. We believe all people must have the unhindered right to be heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, or transsexual. It won't stop there. It'll continue on to the animal community. We want the end of class antagonism among young people. We want the end of racism and colonialism in the United States and the world. We want freedom for all unjustly imprisoned people. We want the right to be economically independent of adults. We want the right to live in harmony with nature. We want to rehumanize existence. We want to develop communication solidarity to the young people of the world in our common struggle for freedom and peace. If the sun make you free, you're free indeed. You can draw up all these lists of the freedoms that you want. But the truth of the matter is, when Satan waves a freedom in front of you, it's only an enticement to more slavery. The only freedom there is, is freedom in Christ. I have been given freedom in Him to serve Him. This is references, these references are a child's bill of rights authored by Richard Farson, March 1974 issue of Ms. Magazine, Youth Liberation Program, List of Wants in the International Year of the Child. The International Year of the Child is connected with the United Nations. And what the United Nations is doing right now to undermine the authority of the home, the mother and father, is an insidious thing. It's eating away at it like a cancer. The United Nations is not the friend of Christianity, and it's not the friend of the Christian home. The United Nations is a satanic organization that is founded upon a satanic vision and the utopian vision that Woodrow Wilson had back in the early 1900s that, that finally came to fruition when the United Nations, after the League of Nations started, then the UN, has finally come to where it is today. And they're passing laws today to take the sovereignty away from America, away from you, and enslave you under a one world government. And they're going to take your kids away from you. You say, you say preacher, you are, you are a, an alarmist and a... Uh, an extremist, and blah, 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 blah. I'm just telling you the truth. Check it out. See if it's true. See if it's so. Here's what Gloria Steinem said. We have to abolish and reform the institution of marriage. By the year 2000, we will, I hope, raise our children to believe in human potential, not God. That's very interesting. That is. That's very interesting. They want to believe in human potential and not God. Brother Fanolio, Stephen, gave me a DVD the other day uh, that was produced by uh, Ron Comfort. The DVD is uh, Evolution versus God. Evolution versus God. I watched it this afternoon. And I'm going to post it on the website just as soon as I can next couple of days. I recommend you watch, especially young people. I have never in my lifetime seen professors in colleges, folks, made a fool of like this DVD did. It broke it down to the bare facts of what they really believe and what they stand on. And they could not answer the questions posed to them and had, and some of them even admitted, it is faith, what we believe. And there's a quotation by Dawkins, who's a notorious atheist, how that if you believe the Bible, I have to paraphrase, quote him, paraphrase him, I can't remember exactly his wording, but he said, to the extent that if you believe the Bible and you believe in Christ, you believe in God, uh, it's all blind faith and, and essentially you, you're, you're a moron, you're a fool, uh, that you believe something by faith. But then they used his very words, they used the words of Dawkins to question these philosophers, psychologists, professors at uh, Berkeley, uh, California, and various places, and they said this, and they admitted that what some of what they believed was de definitely faith. <laughs> I thought, what a remarkable thing. What a remarkable thing. You say, well, I don't, I don't believe in evolution. I did. I believed in it until 1973. I believed I was a tadpole or a worm or a frog or a, uh, you know, something hopping around or crawling out from under a rock or or I just, I didn't believe the Bible. I didn't believe God. I didn't believe, the, I didn't believe any of it. Do you know why I believed it? 
I believe because the people that taught it to me had degrees from the universities. You'd be amazed at how many people in this, in this DVD, that's what they base every bit of their faith on. Well, they got the degrees, and I trust them. They're the scientists, and I believe them. And the Bible talks about science falsely so-called. The Bible is not in opposition to science, folks. Not at all. But it is in opposition to science falsely so-called. Evolution becomes the poster child of the atheist and those who want to deny the Bible and deny the truth of Scripture. But it's an amazing thing when, you, when, you, when, you, when he deals with the issue of kinds. In the book of Genesis, it said everything after its own kind. You know, a kind. That's important. Some of them I'm not even sure understood what he was, the point he was making, but he made his point very well. He did talk about adaptation. They said, well, this beak got longer. And Darwin observed, sure it did. But was it still a bird? Well, yeah, it was still a bird. Did you ever see or have you ever, have you ever witnessed or have you any evidence at all where anything ever crossed over from being a bird to a fish or from a fish to a bird? You know, to paraphrase him again, no. Well, don't you think that that's absolutely necessary for evolution? Yeah. Well, we got a problem then, don't we? And one of the two of them started uh, backpedaling. Yeah. And they could see when they were posed. He used this, for example. Uh, pronounce the word S-H-O-P. Somebody pronounce that for me. Shop. Shop. All right. When you come to a green light, what do you do? <laughs> you stop at green lights? <laughs> see what I mean? And it all worked for them, too. You know why? Their mind was conditioned to a certain response. See what I mean? And the idea is, well, you're, a, you're, a, you're an old backwoods clunker. You're a redneck, this and that, for believing the Bible. No, I'm not. I believe the book. I believe the Bible. And you have never showed me one thing to make me doubt that book. I'm not one bit worried about it after its own kind. So, she says, we want to abolish the institution of marriage. They're moving right along, aren't they? That's right. Supreme Court helped them out with it. Uh, Helen Sullinger in 1973 said, male society sold us the idea of marriage. Male society, chauvinism. Chauvinism, however you pronounce it. Now we know it is the institution that has failed us and we must work to destroy it. Boy, these are strong words. Marriage has failed, she said. It's failed us. The end of the institution of marriage is the necessary condition for the liberation of women. What a high and noble thing. She wants to liberate you women. How many of you women like to be liberated? <laughs> what you do is build a straw man, see. You create, you, create this, you create this fanciful philosophy and work off of that. You, you create something that people can relate to. Oh, Women need to be liberated. Oh, I didn't know I was enslaved, but if I am, I want to be liberated. All right. Are women liberated? Let me give you some of the facts. Divorce rate over 50%. Do you know who pays most when a divorce rate, when a divorce takes place? Especially if there's children involved? The women. Single mothers? Let me read you three posts I took off the internet today. Women, single mothers have their own blog sites and their own post sites where they communicate with each other about their common problems. Here's one. Unscrupulous employers are taking advantage of workers. I've been working for this company for three weeks now and have yet to be paid. I suppose to be paid on the first and 15th of the month, but that's it. She's not being paid. You don't suppose it's because she's a woman? Yeah. So this is my first post. I've never reached out to any support other than my family, so here it goes. A little about my situation. I have two kids from a previous relationship. Notice she didn't say marriage. And I went through hell. Look and think about that. That's not the starry eyed stuff you see on CBS, NBC, and ABC. This is the real world of broken homes. Here's another one. My son is with his father for visitation and is being emotionally abused. His father refuses to give me his address. CPS, I, I believe that's Child Pro Pro Protective Services, and the police have been of no assistance. I just use that as random. 
illustration of the kind of world that these women have to live in who've been liberated. There was a time 50 years ago, 60 years ago, that if you went into a court of law, a woman would have to be absolutely fallen down drunk, running a red light district to lose her children. That's the way it was. The law act definitely leaned toward the mother getting the children. That's an entirely different situation now. It's entirely different. Everything's changed. Why has it changed? Because the woman now has been taken out of that shelter and protection that she had. Amen. And she's been put out in the open. Right. Ill-equipped a lot of times to have to deal with what she has to deal with. She's been liberated all right. Do you know what STDs are, don't you? This was just out three days ago in the news. Sacramento County Health Department will begin distributing a take-home STD test for women that won't cost users a penny. The city has one of the highest rates of STDs in the state and it keeps going up every year. This is Sacramento, California. Uh, by the way, the word Sacramento, Spanish for sacrament. The land of the flowers, California. The Division of Public Health says STDs are spreading like wildfire in Sacramento with, and they name some of the STDs. Women are really liberated, aren't they? And then finally, this one. Suicides among young, young people continue to be a serious problem. Each year in the U.S., thousands of teenagers commit suicide. Teenagers. Suicide is the third leading cause of death. Now listen, for 15 to 24-year-olds. Now listen. And the sixth leading cause of death for 5 to 14-year-olds. We have five-year-old children in this nation committing suicide. Remember, give them to me for the first five years and I've got them for life. So in five years, this child has had enough. We got a problem in this country, don't we? We got a big problem if a five-year-old child has had enough and commits suicide. But women have been liberated, haven't they? You want to know how to liberate a woman? Let me give you two things. In Acts chapter number 16, verse 1, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. We're talking about, well, I'll read it for you, 2 Timothy 1, 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, faith. And I am persuaded that in thee also. Now watch this carefully. Now put this together. And 2 Timothy 3.15, From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Lois taught her daughter Eunice, who taught her son Timothy. That's the way it worked. The faith, though, that Timothy was raised up under was the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See? But the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was as easily transferred to the Lord Jesus Christ as you breathing. See? That's the point. He was taught, he was taught the true faith. The true faith. Not the Kabbalah, not a bunch of foolishness, but the true faith. And at that time, there was no written Talmud. The Talmud was only in, 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 in memory. It wasn't written down until uh, much later. And so what Timothy learned was the Scripture. Now, there's a tradition that says that, that they had the actual Old Testament, the Torah. The Jews much prefer to call it the Torah and uh, the Tanakh. They had that. So he had the truth. And what did the truth do? The truth saved him because he believed it. From a child he was raised in the truth and the truth saved him. You know why they want to take your Bible away from you? Because the Bible is the only counterpart there is to this massive lie that's being pumped out today. This massive deception. 
and it goes all it goes from government through the school system through the through the through the uh, through the whole uh, whole system the whole medical establishment and when I say medical, I'm talking about psychology and philosophy and psychiatry and all the rest of it. Not all of them, but the system itself is built on the supposition that man knows more about what man needs than God does. And he doesn't, folks. He doesn't. He doesn't. From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Have we failed? We failed. We failed. What should have been done, preacher? There should have been war declared back in the 60s when they took prayer out of school. They should have declared war. They should have gotten serious then. Instead of waiting till the cows out of the fence and gone out in the woods and closed the gate, they should have shut it then. They should have declared war. When Madeline Murray O'Hare, I read a little bit about her. She got a printing press in a room somewhere and started printing her material. And her son Murray, her name was his son. Her son's name was Murray, and it was about her son. And she, and she launched this attack against prayer in school and finally went to the Supreme Court and had prayer kicked out of school. Now since then her son got saved and she got chopped up in pieces, which is sad, so sad, such a wasted life. But one woman, one woman went against millions of Christians, quote unquote, <laughs> And one woman had prayer taken out of the school system. You say, well, why is prayer so important? It's like the NRA. Okay. I remember a few years ago, Charlton Heston. I don't turn to Charlton Heston for preaching, you know. He's not my spiritual mentor. But it is the Second Amendment to the Constitution. It's one of the bricks in the building. It's one of the pieces of the foundation. It's one part that's very important. Because if one part begins to crumble and fall, the rest of it follows suit. The idea is if you can keep the Second Amendment in place, keep it in place, then you can, you can, you can, you can, you can have a fortress to secure the rest of them. Because if, if that one falls, the First Amendment goes, friend, you, you're playing games if you think you live in a free country then. And when Heston said that, I joined the NRA. I was over here at a funeral a few years back and had my car parked over there and I had my NRA thing in the back windshield. And the, preacher and, and the, uh, and the uh, mortician looked over at me and said, a preacher with an NRA on there? You know, he was surprised that a preacher could belong to the NRA. I thought to myself, let me put this together. Do you know why I joined the NRA? For the Second Amendment. To support the Second Amendment. It's important. If the Second Amendment falls, the First Amendment, the First Amendment will follow suit. And the Fourth Amendment will go and the rest of them will go. Unlawful seizures and searches. Right now the police, is, police in this country has been militarized. I hope you know that. You might want to know at, at the end of the year, you might, li you, might, you might like to know at the end of the year, uh, it's kind of uh, upsetting, but you might like to know at the end of the year how many doors got kicked down, innocent people got shot to death because they went to the wrong house. <coughs> it's a statistic until it happens to you. You see what I mean? There has to be a vanguard. There has to be a wall. There has to be a stopping point. We can't stop what they've already done. They've already taken prayer out of school. Now there's a fight to try to get the Ten Commandments put up here and Ten Commandments here and the Ten Commandments there. Good. For every little victory that's won, that's another move back in the right direction. Well, what would you have, preacher? I'd have them in there preaching on Friday morning. I'd have them in there like they did at Rule High School. I'd have the preachers come in and get up on the stage and call them into, and call them into the assembly room and open up the Bible and start preaching the Word of God to them. Which God, preacher? The only God there is. <laughs> the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I would. In a heartbeat. I would. They did it back then. And I don't remember a child ever getting shot to death one time in all 12 years that I went through the public school system. Not one time in 12 years. I don't remember one bit of dope that ever got bought or sold in 12 years of the public school system. 
Not one time. I don't remember one time that a, pre that a teacher ever got assaulted. I got busted a few times, but the teachers didn't. <laughs> and I needed, I needed every one I got. <laughs> John Humphreys laid that board on my hind end. You could hear it ringing all the way down rural high school and bouncing off the walls. <laughs> That's okay. I needed it. I needed it. Now you do something like that now and this bunch of come running and oh, you're abusing that child. No child abuse is when nobody gives them any right and wrong. Nobody tells them what's right and wrong. Nobody's there for a daddy. Nobody's there for a mama. What about talking that kind of child abuse? How about talking about that? It comes back to the bottom line, and the bottom line is that for a long time the public school system had it right. Not maybe fully right, but they had a lot of right. And now there's not much right left at all. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray to use what I've said tonight for the glory of God. And bless my brothers and my sisters. Maybe just a little bit of this here and there will awaken people to realize how important the battle is. My Heavenly Father, we can't just sit back and let it go because it won't go right. It won't go any better. But, Lord, we've got to do what's right. When it comes time to go to the election booth, to go to the election booth. When it comes time to find out who's running for office, find out who it is. When it comes time to speak, speak. And, Lord, we pray that you'd give us courage and wisdom to know how to do it and when to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.